Hi, I'm Natalie Brunel, and thanks so much for checking out the Coin Stories podcast video page. I am talking to the legends in Bitcoin about their backstories, career paths, and why they believe in BTC. This podcast does not provide financial advice. This episode is brought to you by the Bitcoin Conference 2022. It's going to be held in Miami next year, April 6th through 9th, and it is going to be a four-day amazing festival with two general admission days, an industry day, and SoundFest. Tens of thousands of people will make their way to Miami and I wanted to share some photos from the 2021 conference because that event is one of the reasons coin stories took off and I was able to secure such amazing interviews with legends like Michael Saylor. Now you want to get your ticket pretty soon because hotels are booking up fast. I know I recently just booked. So head to b.tc slash conference to get your pass and use coin stories as the code for 10% off. This episode is also brought to you by OKCoin, one of my favorite new places to buy Bitcoin. OKCoin is the fastest growing exchange serving over 190 countries globally with the easiest onboarding and lowest fees around. They're on a mission to make learning about and buying Bitcoin easier than ever. And they're all about bringing more financial financial literacy to everyone, which is something I really care about as well. From being the only exchange to integrate Lightning to contributing over a million dollars to Bitcoin core devs, they are doing incredible work to further the Bitcoin ecosystem. You can head to go.okcoin.com slash Natalie for $50 in Bitcoin when you sign up. Super excited to share my guest today is Perry Ann Boring. She's the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce, which happens to be the world's largest trade association representing the blockchain industry. She's been named among America's top top 50 women in tech by Forbes, and one of the 10 most influential people in blockchain by Coindesk. Prior to forming the chamber, perry was a TV host and anchor for an international finance program on RT, and she also worked in the House of Representatives. We talked a lot about the regulatory framework surrounding Bitcoin, so I'm super excited to share. Here's perry -Ann. perry -Ann, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to talk to you and get some of your public policy expertise. So thanks for coming on Coin Stories. Yeah, I'm no, happy to be here. So I want to start at the beginning first and kind of hear your life journey. Um, I read that you were born in Florida. Is that correct? So I was actually born in, uh, in Dallas, Texas. And then uh, my family moved to Florida when I was really young. Uh, but all my family's from Florida and I was raised in Florida. So what was your upbringing like? Um, where did you live? What were your parents doing? What was that like? Yeah, so I'm from a small town called Lakeland. It's right in between Tampa and Orlando. Um, I had a pretty standard like middle class upbringing um my uh, uh my father was a software engineer my mom was a stay-at-home mom and um uh lived in just kind of a uh an urban area and um had just a, a very kind of um you know standard i think american Amer Amer standard american middle class um upbringing um, my, uh, my dad, uh, definitely was my kind of, um, uh, inspiration to go into the tech space. He always worked on computers. I think my brother's first word was pewter, like computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I studied economics in school. So my, my, um, my passion has always been, um, public policy with really a focus in, in um, monetary policy and economics. Yeah, that's fascinating. I wanted to dig into that. So um, what did you want to be when you grew up and how did you choose economics? So if you would ask me when I was a little kid what I wanted to be, I either wanted to be the first woman president um, or a supermodel. Um, not tall enough to be a supermodel. Uh, so I'm still working on becoming the first woman president and uh, I think I'm well on my way. Um, Is but that what you I'm still sure want? What's that? Is that what you still want? <laughs> no, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I interned at the White House and, you know, got to meet the president of the United States and really understand what it means to be the president of the United States. And um, it's a pretty, um, uh, you know, significant thing to sign up for. But, um, you know, I really prefer to kind of be in more of the background helping, you know, developing policy and, um, and just kind of to give you my kind of personal story and journey in, into crypto. So, um, you know, growing up in Florida, I went to the University of Florida public school. 
Um, and I was in school during the financial crisis and my major was in economics. Um, and of course that was when, you know, the housing bubble burst and basically the state of Florida was the housing crisis. And everybody I knew was impacted by that. Um, there were multiple people in my family whose homes went underwater and they ended up losing their, their homes. My cousins lost their, their childhood home. Um, my parents lost 50% of their life savings in the stock market. And um, I mean, my parents worked for everything they had. They didn't inherit anything. So it was really hard just to see how hard they had worked and just to lose that in a way that they had absolutely no control over. And it was of no fault of their own. And of course, we're a middle class family. Nobody went hungry. Nobody went homeless in our family. Everybody was fine. Um, but that wasn't the case for everybody else. And there were a lot of people that were significantly harmed by what was happening in, in the economy. And I just felt, one, kind of frightened about what I was seeing. Um, but two, I wanted to understand it better. Um, and there was a group of us at UF, we're all economics majors, and we really started asking our professors, like, what the heck is actually going on right now in the world? And like, we were not getting answers. And just the, the even just the economic theories that they teach in college don't really truly understand how money works. What are the arrangements uh, between Washington and Wall Street? And how does that impact everybody else? And you have to basically find that information out on your own. And we did. And I'm glad we spent the time to kind of seek that out. And what we really found and what I understood was infuriating. And so when I was in college, I just kind of made this kind of pledged to myself that I want to go to Washington and I want to fight for something better, something that really represents the values that I was I was brought up in. And so I'm still on that journey today. Um, and of course, that was before crypto. So I my senior year of college, I worked as a White House intern um, in the National Economic Council. So it was really an amazing thing. I was the only person from the entire state of Florida there. It's my first time really meeting people outside of kind of my community. And most of the people interning there were all from Ivy League schools. And I was one of the few people from a public school. Um, and um, you get, you know, and I, you know, part of what I was doing was tracking all the stimulus funds, which of course I was very much against. I really didn't believe in bailing out the institutions that made poor decisions and led to kind of this crisis that had happened internationally. And I um, left the White House, went to the Hill, worked on the Hill for a while, and that's when I learned about Bitcoin. Well, let me stop you there because your story is fascinating. I relate to it. My family lost everything in the crash. So that's why I think I was also predisposed to some of the core philosophies and tenets of Bitcoin because I didn't understand how it all happened, why my family who had worked so hard were you know, tax paying, good, hardworking citizens in the middle class who had just bought their first house, like lost everything and Wall Street seems to get bailed out and I was so confused by the whole thing. Um, as far as economics, when I learned about Bitcoin, I didn't even know what you know Austrian versus Keynesian economics were. So are you saying that when you were in school and you were asking professors, were you in that sort of Keynesian education environment where the direction was like, no, government spending is good, the government has to intervene? And did you start to think maybe that's not the appropriate way? Yeah, I'm looking on my bookshelf. I kept my my one of my um, economics textbooks, um, which was written by Ben Bernanke, who at the time was the chair of the Federal Reserve. So yeah, in in, in schools today, they mostly teach Keynesian economics. So one of the things that really just made me the most angry about the whole process is nobody even bothered to tell us that this is a theory, and that there's other theories, and that. Uh, there's other ways to look at how an economy works. Um, and so I did study you know, Austrian economics. There's a lot of Austrian authors that I've been following over the years. And that's really what helped kind of just, I, that was my own education on my own yeah. um, that I did. And that helped really form my understanding. But it's like, if you took a religion class, they would kind of walk you through like many different types of religions around the world. And like, this is what religion is. When it comes to economics, they're indoctrinating you. And it's like, you have to be very lucky or just really, really diligent to even understand that there's other ways to look at this. And that was just really disheartening. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear. Well, 
when you were on the Hill, I mean, I, I don't think things were as politically divided back back then, right, before you discovered Bitcoin. But now they're, I think it's just, we've never been more polarized. But what was your experience in Washington, D.C. like? And how did politics play into it? Because I hate when people politicize Bitcoin. I think that it can solve a lot of these political issues that we're having. And, and also, it's just um, both sides have run up the deficit. And both sides have, you know done all this spending and made these false promises and been in office decades and the problems are just getting worse. So I don't think this is like a red or blue thing. Yeah, I mean, it was very polarizing when I worked on the Hill. Um, when I um, started working on the Hill, it was right around like the Tea Party movement. And um, there, there, there has been pretty significant division in Congress, but it is getting worse. Um, I do not believe that Bitcoin um, should be a political issue. Um, we've worked really hard to try to make it not a political issue. This is about technology. This is about financial inclusion. This is about economic development and jobs and innovation. Um, it should not be a part. Uh, it should not be about things from the left or the right perspective. Um, we are getting a lot more criticism from the left. We do seem to have more support from the right um, kind of broadly, it has been easier to get Republican policymakers to support our cause, um, but we do have champions within the Democratic Party as well. And the reason why I actually think this is, um, is because as a community, we have not done a very good job of helping progressives, Democrats, the left liberals, um, really understand how this technology is going to benefit much broader communities, specifically those who would really benefit um, from um, financial inclusion. We've right. talked a lot about financial inclusion. I think most of us really understand the promise and the potential there, um, but we haven't as a community done a great job of being able to show how this technology today is helping real people in real communities that have been marginalized to date. And I think until we're able to get that messaging out in front of people and really help people see how important this is to underdeveloped areas of the world um, or people who have just really not um, been able to be served by traditional financial services systems today, um, I think we'll continue to struggle with that. So that's something um, we've been talking a lot about at the chamber because I think it's, um, is a really important part of the conversation. Yeah, so I want to hear specifically like how you first heard about Bitcoin and went down the rabbit hole. But first, what were your first sort of jobs um, in the Capitol or or in Washington, D.C.? And how did you segue into becoming a, a journalist? You were at RT, too. So I want to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, so I um, I worked on Capitol Hill for um, Congressman Dennis Ross. Um, he was a member of the Financial Services Committee. Um, I um, I personally am you know would consider myself libertarian, um, and I was pretty outspoken about that on the Hill. I really enjoyed working on the Hill. Um, I got to meet um, and talk with Dr. Ron Paul many times. Who was truly one of my kind of inspirations. I um, had the opportunity to. Um, push forward a lot of his legislative proposals, like his um, bill on audit the Fed and competing um, competing currencies acts. Um, these are um, pieces of legislation that um, really promote, um, uh, you know, having a more sound monetary policy. He's great. Um, so people knew, you know, a lot of people on the Hill knew. Like I was very interested in these kind of libertarian leaning ideas, and so I just had a friend that said, "Hey." I know um, you're really into to these types of things. I found out about this thing called Bitcoin. I really think you might like it. And it was just kind of like a random tip. And um, so I looked it up and this was like in 2011. So there was not much to look up back then. I think like I watched a lot of Andreas Antonopoulos YouTube videos back then. Um, there was like, you know, other, like you could listen to like tech developers um, but we didn't have the types of resources that we had today. But this whole idea that there was this currency out there that was not developed by a government or corporation or a group of people, 
um, or controlled by them. To me, that was just like a fascinating concept. And so I very quickly fell down a rabbit hole and um, I personally just studied it on my own best I could. And I ultimately came to the conclusion that this is the most important thing um, I, I will ever see in my lifetime. And this really will enable all of the policy things that I've been fighting for in my work in policy. And I really wanted to see this technology succeed and I just couldn't sit on the sidelines. And so that's when I, um, I jumped in after going through that own personal journey. Um, but you asked about going into journalism. So after working on the Hill for several years, um, I was recruited to go to RT. It's um, RT stands for Russia Today. So it's a media outlet that's sponsored by the state of Russia. And um, it's the second largest news network in the world behind the BBC. And um, RT has a bureau in DC called RT America. And I hosted a show from that bureau on financial services. Um, so it was a really amazing opportunity. I had the, 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 the chance to, to work in television and um, it was kind of interesting because I had no actual formal training in television. I didn't know how to read a teleprompter, none of that stuff. Yeah. Um, but they called me and they asked me if I would come audition. I was like, okay, this sounds cool. So I did. Wow. And I didn't do that great in the audition. And they're like, look, we think you'll be good. You just need a little bit of training. So I, I did training for about a month and I auditioned again and then I got the job. Wait, so I mean, but I would think that you wouldn't want to work for a place that was run by, you know, a government, much less... Russia of all things. So were you able to put the show together and be like the kind of journalist that, that you wanted and, and sort of stay true to your libertarian views or what was that experience like? Yeah. I mean, it was really interesting. Um, because, uh, one, I learned all about how the television industry works and how the media industry works. Um, and one of the, the things that I learned is that any media outlet you work for is going to have a bias. If you work for Fox news, they have a very right-leaning narrative. If you work for MSNBC, it's very left-leaning. If you work for Coin Stories, it is Bitcoin-leaning, you know? So like every media outlet is going to have a bias. Um, after working for a Russian company, I, you know, ultimately felt somewhat uncomfortable being there as an American. Um, I, I would never work for a Russian company again, and that's not to disparage um, Russia, but it, it really was not the right fit for me long term. Um, but it did give me the opportunity to, um, you know, to do, uh, to work in TV and to have a show. And, um, and one of the things that actually appealed to me about this show is that they, it was a, a show focused on alternative financial services. Um, so they didn't compete with like the Fox businesses or the CNBCs because their brand is very different. So they cover kind of um, more under the radar type, type things. And the main beat on my show was Bitcoin. Nice. So I, I likely was the first international reporter covering Bitcoin on a regular basis. And so my show was um, launched in 2013. And so having, uh, you know, being a journalist covering Bitcoin in 2013 was probably the biggest gift you could give to any journalist because 2013 oh. was the breakout year of Bitcoin. I'm so sad that I didn't meet you because I lived in DC in 2012. I, f I finished my grad school there and gosh darn it. I, if yeah, I we could have been. You, <laughs> we would have been so on the same wavelength. I didn't know about Bitcoin until five years after that. But so you must have been familiar then with Max, right? Because Max was, I think, one of the first people putting putting out the idea of, hey, invest in Bitcoin on that network, right? Yeah. And Max, yeah. So Max and Stacy, um, they had a little bit different arrangement where they have their own company and they create a show and then they sell that show to RT. Um, this show was developed in-house um, at RT. Um, but, you know, there has been a lot of criticisms of like censoring and stuff like that. I personally never experienced that with what I was doing. Um, I, but I, there, I, you know, I will say there is a slant. It didn't impact what I was doing. So it, 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 it didn't, um, I was able to have, you know, a really amazing opportunity getting into Bitcoin so early. Um, so are they pro Bitcoin out there in Russia? Do a lot of Russians have Bitcoin? You know, I I have not studied like the Russian markets very closely. I, I don't know what those what those stats look like. I'm not sure. I've, I've never been to Russia. I don't speak Russian, um, so I I'm not totally familiar with how the industry is developing there. 
Got it. Well, um, tell me a little bit more about why you became so convicted about Bitcoin, because, um, you know, back then, arguably, it was much more fragile of a network. I think the government could have at that point come in and totally shut it down. Why did you have so much faith that it was the future and that you wanted to start to dedicate really your career to it? Yeah, I mean, for I mean, I just felt really convicted that like this, this was it. Um, this is what we've been looking for. And this, this is what's needed. And when I first got into Bitcoin, the price was like 10 or $12. So to go from that to today, where at the time of recording, Bitcoin's at about $56,000. I don't even check the price price anymore in the yeah. 50s or the 60s um it's it's really amazing to see kind of what's happened in the industry and i've you know i've had the benefit of being in long enough to see um many different cycles but there was just something inside of me that said like this is it and i fully yeah. believed that and um and i think um you know today is like really a testament to those people who were on the ground so early um, who worked really, really, really hard to get us to where we are today. Um, and this is a very righteous thing to keep following and keep pushing for. Um, but it's, um, to me, there is a huge need for sound money. And the current monetary system of having, you know, every, every country in the world being on fiat currencies with these expansionary monetary policies, it's not sustainable. Our global debt to GDP ratio is over 300%. And it's been there for years, which means we are spending more than 300% of what we're producing. It's just logically, there's no, no way that can continue forever. Like there will be a breaking point. And I truly believe Bitcoin is best positioned to be that platform that's gonna get us back to having a more sound monetary system. Yeah, it's crazy to think that people don't even recognize that there are consequences to this anymore. I, I remember reading in Bitcoin Standard, I think Saifedean called it the deficit without tears when the U.S. became the global reserve currency and they were able to just print and then everyone became sort of addicted over the decades along with us. And it's really sad because you're right, we're like, we're not making that money on taxes. So we're essentially borrowing the money a lot of times from ourselves, buying the treasury bonds. But what's what's saddest is most people don't understand that concept people don't know how money printing works and because sure they don't teach you that in school i think it's all yeah. intentional yeah i mean i actually looked into that and over 50 so the fed finds all sorts of academic institutions and it's estimated about 50 percent of all economic professors who are working in academia are somehow on the Fed's payroll. So it is like this indoctrination of this Keynesian theory of economics. And to be able to break free from that and understand that things can be different, you really have to go outside of the norm. Yeah. And you're, you're you know, truly like an outsider. Now that's growing, that movement's really growing. But for a long time, I felt very alone in this mission. Um, and one area where I've seen this change is, you know, inflation has always been something I've been concerned about is the idea of printing money is just there's no way that that is something you can do forever. And we've been doing that for a long time. And so 15 years I was raising the alarms um, on Capitol Hill, like inflation, this is a problem. We should be following it. We should be studying it. We should introduce bills to try to stop this. Like, this is not good. Like, we need to hone in on this. People thought I was nuts. And just, you know, today. That according to CNN, the number one issue for voters today, American voters today, is inflation. Yes. Inflation. Yep. So to go from you are nuts to this is the most important issue, like in a matter of less than a year, it has happened so quickly. And I, you know, we're kind of talking about this, these geopolitical trends. There is going to be a breaking point, and it's going to happen in our lifetimes, maybe soon where this global system that's very fragile and propped up by, by um, money printing and inflationary policies, it's going to come to a breaking point. I agree. And there will be very rapid shifts on the global stage and things will change very quickly. And like we are already starting to see the earliest signs of that. Yeah, no, I, I'm on the same page as you. And it's funny because until I discovered Bitcoin, I didn't have any hope. I was like, I don't know where we're going. And Bitcoin is like, oh, thank God, truly thank God that we have Bitcoin. So, okay, back to back to your path. So you left RT. Um, how did you start the chamber? And just talk to me about your career journey since then, because you've been doing so, so, so much work to help educate the policymakers. 
Yeah. So um, in working at RT, I had the opportunity to cover cover Bitcoin very closely. So I went to the very first ever Bitcoin conference in San Jose in 2013. I want to say it was in March of 2013. Um, all the earliest companies, um, I announced a lot of those raises. Um, so like blockchain.info's original raise, BitGo's original raise, um, BitInstant, which was Charlie Shum's company and the, 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 the Winkle Boss twins um, were one of the investors in that. So it was there for that announcement. So I saw all these really young people raising tens of millions of dollars um, on you know, these crypto ideas. Um, and then, uh, so that was kind of what was developing on the industry side, which was really exciting to see. And then on kind of the more ge geopolitical side, the, um, the big thing that happened for Bitcoin, I call 2013 the breakout year for Bitcoin um, because in the summer, that's when the country of Cyprus went through its bailouts with the European Union. And every couple of years, there's a country that goes into an economic crisis. They have to negotiate some type of bailout situation with the European Union. So that year was Cyprus. Um, and there was talks that Cyprus would actually leave the European Union and go off the euro and go back to a local currency. And so that was a moment of um, significant economic certainty for the people of Cyprus. And they started buying Bitcoin. And that was the news story. Um, and that was one of the stories that I covered as well. And um, that was the first time Bitcoin made international coverage. But the reason why it was really interesting to me is because it was the first time that we saw Bitcoin being used in a real world instance as an alternative monetary instrument. And so to me, it was like um, the first pilot or the first test case. And so it's, that was really exciting to watch. And then right after that, there were some really bad things that happened um, and that changed the press cycle just instantly. Um, Mount Gox, the Mt. Gox collapse, it was the largest bankruptcy in the history of Japan. Tons of customers, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of customers funds just went missing, huge black eye. And then you had Silk Road. Um, the dark market where people were buying and selling drugs using cryptocurrencies that was shut down. And it was all over the internet, all over the news, all of the mainstream media. And it was kind of crazy because, you know, as a journalist who was like one of the kind of top people following this literally every single day, now you started having like the Wall Street Journal and RT and Reuters covering the space. And it's like, what are they talking about? Like they clearly, the headlines yeah, yeah. were very yeah, misleading. It. It's like, they clearly don't, they didn't read, like they don't truly understand what's happening here. There's so much, it's so much to this day. Yeah. And then you saw the regulatory machine just speed up, which that was really, as someone living and working in DC with really a policy background, that was when I started getting very anxious. There were multiple hearings on Capitol Hill following that. Um, the SEC, the IRS all put out statements saying, you know, warnings about Bitcoin and the dangers of Bitcoin. Um, New York decided to move forward and put together what's called the Bit License, which is now in place today. But it was all in response to Silk Road and Mt. Gox. And so I, in my work as a journalist, and I, you know, had met with and talked to pretty regularly a lot of the early people in Bitcoin investors and VCs and the CEOs and the builders. And I kept telling people, like, there's a hearing, they're talking really badly about <laughs> Bitcoin, like someone should be here to explain what's happening. Like nobody gets it. There's no one here from the Bitcoin community explaining what happened, helping them understand it, clearing up their concerns, addressing like false information. Like you're you, like people fully didn't understand what was happening. And that was just, and I kept saying like, someone needs to come here. Like, please come here, go meet. Like I will gladly go walk you down to the hill not to like be a lobbyist for you, but just to kind of help get you going in the right direction. And nobody would do it. Like nobody was showing up. And after about six months of like telling people that I just had this like voice in my head that basically was just like, this is what you're supposed to do. Like you, if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. You are in DC. You understand the problem. You have the vision, like you are meant to do this. And so I left the media and, um, and started working on developing what is now the chamber. And I spent close to a year developing the charter and getting it all together before we formally launched it in 2014. Is it essentially like a nonprofit where you we are a nonprofit? Yeah. And you lobby, these are lobbying efforts. So um, the chamber is organized as a 501 C six. So it's a trade, a trade association. Um, the way trade associations work, um, so we don't pay federal taxes. Um, 
Uh, and because of that, um, you know, we have to, our revenue has to come from specific sources. So companies pay annual dues to the organization. And that's where our money comes from. That's where our revenue comes from to support the efforts of the organization. And most trade associations are organized like that. So we do not sell products or services. We're not consultants. We can't come in and like help you or your company with something specific, like getting XYZ approved through the SEC. We don't do that. We're working on behalf of the industry as a whole. Um, and I, I, as a as a trade group, um, uh, we can also lobby. So we are a nonprofit, but we are registered to lobby. We're registered lobbyists. So we, and what that means is we can take positions on policy. So we can go to policymakers and say, like, we would like you to vote yes or no on that. Um, other nonprofits aren't, they're, they're, you, you can't take policy positions. You can't go advocate for things. You can educate, but you can't advocate. So we, we have the ability to do that, but we have, you know, restrictions with where our funds and our revenue and things like that come from. Got it. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the environment and the regu regulatory framework that exists right now. Um, we had the infrastructure bill, and I know that you have a couple of insights into some of the portions of that that relate to crypto. And also just in general, the idea that here we are all these years later from when you first came into the industry where the SEC has at least approved futures, ETFs, um, unfortunately, uh, they said no to that spot ETF. There are bank regulators looking at whether traditional banks can hold Bitcoin. So just kind of like pick, painting that macro view from the public policy and the regulatory side, what's your take? We are in a critical moment for public policy impacting digital assets like Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, I've been working on this for going on a decade now and have been you know, on the ground in Washington, D.C., working with our policymakers since the very, very beginning of crypto policy. And where we are today is like something I've never seen before for crypto. Um, in the earliest of days, you did have concerns. So I kind of talked about the backlash from Silk Road and Mt. Gox, and a lot of those concerns were coming from law enforcement. Um, and they were, well, those black eyes still exist. I think we're still like recovering from those. A lot of people still think like crypto is just used for illicit purposes. Like, people still actually believe that. Um, I, but there was no like concerted efforts really to bring things in. Like there was a lot of exploratory things. You did have some early regulatory initiatives, specifically on the state side. There was a little bit of frameworks. Like we got guidance from the IRS. We got guidance from FinCEN. Um, so there was a little bit of dabbling, some very kind of basic things from a policy perspective, but now it's like a full on, like full frontal policy review, regulatory oversight inquiry, and every agency is making cryptocurrency a priority. They're all trying to understand what their jurisdiction is, how they can regulate, how they can enforce, and um, and what they, they should be doing to protect against illicit activity. So the main actors in that would be the executive office, so from the White House, Treasury, and in Treasury, you have FinCEN, um, and OFAC, and then the IRS. Um, SEC, obviously, with Chair Gensler, he is very much looking to expand his authority as much as possible to have much power over the crypto space as possible. Um, and then you have the CFTC, which is like kind of that counterbalance to the SEC. Um, and then you have a couple of new folks like FSOC. So for the very first time, we have a formal FSOC process applying to stablecoins, um, you know, one form of cryptocurrency. And then you also have the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, who in the past really hadn't done much of anything, but now um, they, they do have focused efforts on crypto. And then there's Congress. And um, as someone who worked in Congress, Congress is a, a relatively dysfunctional body, policymaking body. It was designed that way. In all fairness, it was designed so it's really hard to get things passed into law. Um, because that's it was designed. If you have a new law, it should be like really heavily debated and it should have to go through a lot of hoops to ultimately um, be enacted. Um, so Congress has been really slow to act, but now there's a lot of interest on the Hill. So there's a lot more hearings, a lot more legislative proposals being introduced. So there is, um, uh, we, we are engaging like from every single direction at this point and uh, we're running on all cylinders and um, it's a really intense time for those who are working on crypto policy and we're in a very high stakes moment. 
is it going in the right direction in your opinion? Like, does it seem like the government is going to be favorable toward this technology and pass regulation that will be deemed fair by the community? Or do you think it's, it's, we've got some serious work and threats ahead? It's a little bit of both. So in the long run, I think all this stuff is inevitable. I think blockchain technology is ultimately going to be the rails that we use to send anything of value. It's just, that's the word turning. The, the world is globalizing. The global economy is building and hardening every day. Blockchains are going to be a huge part of that. Like this is happening. Um, I don't think we're going to see massive bans on things like cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin or stable coins. Um, I think at this point, it has already been decided that this technology um, should be allowed to operate here in the U.S. At this point, we're really just negotiating what the frameworks look like. So policymakers, they do have legitimate concerns. I'm not saying we need to necessarily, all of their concerns need regulatory overhauls to address them, but policymakers do have regulatory concerns, investor protections, consumer protections, illicit finance risks, and we should address those. And if we're building financial infrastructure that's going to serve the global economy in a whole new way. It needs to be hard and it needs to work and it needs to be reliable. So I think a lot of these conversations are warranted, um, but it's really important that we're at the table to make sure they're shaped in the right way so we don't regulate things out of existence or stifle their growth or stifle their innovation or stifle their development. I'm happy to kind of talk about those things in a lot more detail. If you want to get into like the tax side of things in, in more detail or kind of what's going on at the SEC in more detail, but that's really the general theme. This is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. There's going to be a number of new laws that come into place. Companies are going to have to address, but this is a incredibly resilient industry. And I don't think there's any government that can stop what's happening. Well, that's really encouraging to hear. Can we uh, talk a little bit about the infrastructure bill and 6050i and just what you know that's happening? Because one thing for me that's been frustrating to see, and this doesn't just go to to the crypto side of things, but just in general, when I see politicians voting on things that they clearly don't understand, maybe they just haven't had the time or their staff's not up or, or, or maybe they're just going against it for the sake of, you know, something else they want because everything's about politics and who gets what at what cost, you know? Um, but what is in the infrastructure bill and specifically, can you touch on 6050? Yeah, so so we could do hours of podcasting just on everything that happened around the infrastructure bill. It really was um, the theme of my entire summer. Um, so the bill has been passed into law. The president, um, President Biden, signed it last Monday. Um, so there's two major things that are a problem for me. Um, one is 6050i. Um, 6050i is a provision that treats crypto like cash transactions. So there is a law in place today and it says if someone buys something over $10,000 with cash, like in person, like duffel bags of bills, um, that the merchant who accepts that money has to report that to the government. They have to collect the name and the social security number of that person making this large pur purchase in cash. And the reason that was put into place is because there's, I guess, a high degree of likelihood that if someone's walking around with that type of cash, that that cash probably came from illicit sources. So regardless if we think that's the right thing or not, I mean, maybe, I don't know what the percentage of likelihood is that that money is traced back to illicit sources, but that's the history. So now in the infrastructure bill, they have decided that crypto um, should be treated the same way. And so 6050i says if you purchase something for more than $10,000 with crypto, the merchant has to collect that person's name and social security number and report it. Um, I personally believe this is very discriminatory. It assumes that crypto users are automatically criminals, which is just not true. Less than 1% of all cryptocurrency transactions are linked to illicit sources that comes from the crypto crime report from chain analysis. So the same type of risk is not there. 
Um, yet we're assumed we are criminals. And two, it creates a massive data privacy issue. So if you are in person, so this was really written for in-person transactions because you're dealing with cash. You have to be there in person to give the cash over. Um, if you're buying something in crypto, you're probably doing it in a virtual setting. Maybe you're, you're in person, that's possible. But I feel like a lot of this is being done in a virtual setting, which means now merchants are being turned into cops they're collecting incredibly sensitive information and makes them more susceptible to things like ransomware and being hacked. Um, and now we have to come up with a way for that information to be um, shared in a safe way. Um, so it's highly problematic and it's discriminatory. So it and is it my passed. own personal- Like this is law now. Yeah. Wow. This is law. So it is my own personal mission that we, we um, fight back against this. And part of this is helping educate people what exactly this is so people can know how to advocate for themselves. Um, but we are also working to get Congress to fix this. And there has already been a bill introduced as bipartisan support. Um, but the lead um, sponsor is Patrick McHenry. He's the ranking member on House Financial Services, who so is the, the highest position in leadership from the Republican Party on that committee. And he has put forward a provision to get rid of that um, in the infrastructure bill. So there is support to get rid of it, um, but it's highly problematic. So that's 6050i. And then the other piece, which is just the total disaster, the other piece is the information reporting provisions. These are not as, as disastrous as... <laughs> 6050i, but they're they're also very problematic. So information reporting, um, for those who are not total tax nerds like myself, information reporting is a very basic part of our tax our tax infrastructure here in the U.S. So typically, when somebody is um, making an investment, you use a third party to make your investments, like a like a broker, like a Merrill Lynch, for example. They collect all of your information about all your trades, and they give you information at the end of the year. And it basically just says, "This is everything you did on the platform. Give this to your accountant, and they will use that to calculate your taxes." And they also send that information to the government as well, and they use that for compliance purposes. It's very basic, and it makes it really, really easy for people to invest in things like stocks and to have like a very streamlined compliance process. So, um, uh, the so information reporting already applies to crypto before the infrastructure bill was even passed into law. It already applies. Um, however, because crypto does not fit very neatly into existing IRS guidance, many, many companies like the exchanges have had a lot of questions about how to implement this in a real world setting using cryptocurrencies, not stocks. And so the industry for years has actually already been asking the IRS to help answer a bunch of questions about information reporting. How are we supposed to do this? How does that fit in? What type of accounting systems are we using? Just all the basics on how to put it into place. Um, so information reporting, getting clarity from that can be a good thing for businesses, um, unless we're trying to force entities to do information reporting who can't. So if you're using an exchange um, who has all your information, it's a third party, they're an intermediary, they're taking custody of your funds, they have that type of information. Um, and information reporting can be applied in that setting. However, the way these definitions were written, they could be interpreted that the miners, node operators, validators, and potentially um, developers could be um, inadvertently looped into these definitions of who's responsible for doing this. And that would be devastating because those entities can't collect this information, which means they would not be in compliance. So they would either have to operate illegally or shut down or move overseas. So I'm... Um, because they would be treated like brokers, right? Like a minor. If would be treated they like are a treated like brokers, if they are. So the language is broad. And this was what the whole fight was about. For those who are following crypto Twitter in the news, everyone was like, you need to like make sure the miners and the node operators are included in this. Because right now the bill text is really broad and we it's not really clear. So what ultimately transpired there is um, we were unable to get any changes to the bill text itself. Um, the reason why that ended up being so difficult is because the infrastructure bill is a huge piece of legislation and there were hundreds of members of Congress, both in the, the Senate and the House, that wanted amendments. It's a large bill, it has lots of implications across many industries and many people were saying, well, I want you to fix this definition or I want you to fix that or I want you to do this or whatever. And so if they opened up an amendment process, the whole bill probably would have never made it through the legislative process. So they couldn't allow any changes 
Um, and there was huge political will to get this done. I don't think that is the way it should be done. Just for the record, this is very bad policy making. This is an example of how to not do public policy. Um, but that's why it like th those were the political realities we were dealing with. So instead of getting amendments to the bill, um, we were given these assurances. Um, they're not legally as hard, but it's what we have. Um, so the drafters of the bill did direct IRS to not include those actors in the provision as a broker. And then we also were able to get statements from the White House and Treasury also saying it's not, not our intention to do that. So we are optimistic this is going to go in the right way. We don't have anything that's pointing us to think that those types of organizations would be looped into this. Um, but now is the time for us as an industry to ensure that happens. So what we're doing at the chamber is serving as a resource to the IRS, make sure they know, are very aware of these assurances that were made and to help be a resource to them as they're drafting the guidance um, and being a part of, of flushing out all of these information reporting requirements that are gonna be directed to the industry over the next few years. Wow, thank you so much for all that information. It's it's so it's so great to have an expert like you and I can't wait to have you on our bipartisan Bitcoin panel just to flesh out some of this some more. So, um I have a couple of last questions. This next one's going to be kind of a just a philosophical almost uh, tongue in cheek one, but there's so much to learn about Bitcoin. If you go down the rabbit hole, I mean, you could get lost down there, right? It's just, it's complicated. It's beautifully simple, but it's also just so complex. And you really have to understand things like Austrian economics and sort of how government functions and how the monetary policy works. So I always think of Bitcoin as sort of the genie that you can't put back in the bottle. But what if there was a genie where you could just make a wish that would allow politicians in Washington, D.C. to become very well versed in, you know, Bitcoin. Like what 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 do you wish could happen in a more realistic sense that would really educate the majority of Congress or, po you know, policymakers on Bitcoin? Like what do you wish could happen or what are you working toward? Yeah, well, if that happened, then I could retire. So I, I could I could live the rest of my life very happy. Um, so, I mean, I guess if I could wish anything, it would be to make Bitcoin legal tender. Um, and there would be, um, or at least um, change the way that it's taxed so it can be used as a currency. And this is what I believe is a huge hindrance to the mass adoption of Bitcoin today. So as you may know, Bitcoin is taxed and all cryptocurrencies are taxed as property, which is very similar to how stocks are taxed. So if you, um, so you're subject to um, capital gains and losses, which means it's taxed at the transaction level. So if you buy a coffee for $5 at Starbucks with your crypto, um, you have to record when you got that crypto, when you spent it and what the change in price was and you have to report that. Um, that's incredibly complicated and does not really work if we're gonna use this um, in, in, a, in that type of setting. Um, so I would like for us to, I would, I think in a free country, people should be able to use whatever they want for money, whether that's something that's sponsored by the government or a metal or some crazy internet money, people should be able to use what they want. And because of the way it's taxed now, they can't. Um, so I would like to see that freedom. Um, so people can make those types of choices and not have to use a government monopoly as money. What did you think when Hillary Clinton said that this threatens the U.S. dollar and destabilizes nations? And do you think like that the that Bitcoin and the U.S. dollar will coexist someday? Well, they already are. I mean, they do. They already do coexist. Um, I didn't watch the full speech. I haven't had a chance to do that yet. I've just seen the headlines. So I don't know the full context, but I believe she was speaking from a national security perspective. Um, and I, I think Senator Lummis had a really good response where she said, I think you're thinking about this all wrong. Bitcoin is going to be one of the most important assets in the world, and we should be ensuring we're harnessing that for the benefit of the United States. So I, I, I think I completely agree with, with how Senator Lummis um, kind of um, responded to that. Um, and I think we should be embracing this technology at the highest levels, which means allowing people to use it to pay for goods and services. It means having a tax regime that um, enables people to, to use um, you know, whatever they want in transactions. Um, I think it also means um, I, 
uh, mining Bitcoin in the United States. I think that's incredibly important to our um, national security as well. And I also think we should be investing in Bitcoin for treasury management pur purposes, just like companies like Square and Tesla and MicroStrategy are doing, the government should be doing that too. Um, and there are some people running for congressional office that have proposed um, having the government invest in, in in Bitcoin for treasury purposes. And I think we should be doing that. Well, I understand that the U.S. government does have Bitcoins, at least from civil forfeiture. I don't know if they've also purchased, but is there a possibility that they are doing this and just not making anyone aware of it? <laughs> that is a very smart question. So we have been filing FOIAs for over a year across the government to try to understand how much Bitcoin the government actually owns. And we are not getting responses. We keep getting these very odd letters back, like you didn't word the question right, so you have to resubmit. Or we don't have information that fits this very particular way you've worded this question. So um, there's definitely attempts for government to kind of not want to disclose what that looks like. And we don't actually know what that looks like. But the government does own a significant amount of Bitcoin from um, seizing it from um, criminal activity. Uh, and I think it should be made public information exactly how much the government owns and exactly what they're doing with it. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree. Um, what is the most rewarding part of what you do and what is the most challenging? Uh, most rewarding. I mean, I think it's it's super rewarding um, when you start seeing how Bitcoin has impacted real people's lives. And I think one of the most amazing stories was actually a story I heard um, on your podcast from Roya, who um, her and many people she had known for many years throughout Afghanistan had to basically escape the country. And um, there was a number of women who had earned Bitcoin through her program um, years ago. And when they had to evacuate, all they could bring with them was next to nothing. Um, but these women were smart enough to bring their Bitcoin by like memorizing their private keys. And then when they go to wherever they're restarting their lives, they actually had the means to restart their lives. I've, I, I don't know if I've really seen anything as powerful of, of, as, as that. And that is the most amazing example of Bitcoin enabling freedom at a very extreme level. Um, so those types of stories are just unbelievable to, to see. And I think we'll see more of those as the industry continues to grow. Um, what is the most challenging? I would say time management is a huge issue at this point. There's a lot of demand um, for what we do. Um, and the tables have really turned. I mean, when we launched in 2014, people had no idea what Bitcoin was. Members of Congress were like, we don't understand what this is. This is, uh, you know, it's hard to get people to take a meeting for you, you know, in length so you can get into the substance. People just weren't that interested. Um, and now it's the complete opposite. People really are interested in what this is. We get, we get more requests than almost we can even respond to at this point for educational information and for briefings and to help people with different policy recommendations that they're working on. So just being able to manage just the amount of work that has to be done, both serving as a resource to policymakers, but also advancing the advocacy work of the organization um, is, uh, is my, my biggest thing that I'm working on. So we're, we're hiring, we're scaling, we're trying to create as many efficiencies within the organization as possible. So open call for those who are interested in the public policy efforts, um, definitely reach out to us because we need all the help we can get at this moment. Why can't all the members of Congress and their staff members just read the Bitcoin standard? I don't get it's pretty easy. Like that was my orange pill and it was the best orange pill that anyone could give me. <laughs> Well, you know what we should do is we should we should go and uh, um, uh, do a um, either like a book signing or just a briefing on the hill, and then go deliver a copy to every single office. I think we should. We need to call Saint Benin. I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest this to him. Um, just to kind of wrap it up, I I do want to touch a little bit back on that subject of bipartisan because. Um, you know, you've been in Washington for a long time. I think the country is just so divided and people are just exacerbated. And I just think most people don't even trust who's in office representing them anymore. There's just such like a collective frustration because 
you know, the problems are getting worse in terms of the middle class declining. Things are getting more expensive. These problems that government is sort of throwing money at just keep getting bigger and bigger. And I think the average person, again, is coming from a place of just not understanding how the system really works. So um, how do we keep Bitcoin bipartisan in such a divisive environment when, as you've mentioned, it sort of is naturally pulled and more accepted by one side so far. And I personally worry that one side could sort of hijack it and the other just by virtue of, you know, going against the the other party all of a sudden is against it when they don't really understand it. Like, how do we make Bitcoin bipartisan? So I actually think Bitcoin is going to be the next technology to truly expand and increase participation in the political process. So if you follow campaigns, um, it's always been whatever candidate has embraced the most cutting edge technology at the time that gets some type of edge. And we saw this with candidate Obama, who really leveraged phones and text messages for the first time, where they were giving out phones, cell phones, and they were sending these mass text messages and nobody else was doing that. And they were able to rally a base and that obviously ended very well for President Obama. Um, And then um, candidate Trump, of course, was the candidate of Twitter. And he was using social media to reach a constituency that really had not um, been activated before. I think Bitcoin is the next one. And I think whatever party is able to leverage this technology in a way to reach more people um, is going to have a huge benefit from that. And if you look at just the stats today, according to various studies, anywhere between 20 and 40 percent of Americans own cryptocurrency today. But if you break that down into demographics, it's over 40 percent of millennials in the United States own cryptocurrencies. And it is a priority of both the Republican and Democratic parties to bring in participation from those younger generations. And I think Bitcoin is the way to do that. I love that. Awesome. Well, any final thoughts or just anything else you really want people to know, especially given some of the headlines? We're having some choppy price action, sadly, but just anything else um, before we share how people can find you and your chamber? I was, uh, one of the other just kind of policy things that's a huge priority for us is around stable coins. There is a significant effort to bring stable coins into um, a prudentially regulated environment. And we see a number of things that are problematic with that. There are some silver linings um, with that as well, but there's definitely some pretty significant concerns. And this really is, is bad for everybody. Um, over um, 50, it's estimated from the exchanges that about 50% of Bitcoin transactions are facilitated using stable coins. Um, so stable coins are a part of our infrastructure. And so it's really important that they, um, they have a legal structure so they can continue to grow and be used um, as they're intended to. And that is, that is a big threat. So for those who are either focused on stable coins or interested in stable coins, definitely recommend checking out Um, the work that we're doing there. Um, We publish all of our policy proposals on our website um, at digitalchamber.org. We believe in transparency to a T. So anything that we are pushing or advocating for or lobbying for, it's all disclosed on our website. Um, So if you're interested in learning more, you can go there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been really great. I'm going to have to have another show with you just on maybe more of the in-depth onto the infrastructure bill. Uh, I even want to talk to you about, you know, central bank digital currency. So I'd love to have you back on, but thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much, Natalie.